Hey there, this is your orchestration tutor, Thomas Goss. Welcome to the semi-brev level evaluations for the 2022 orchestration challenge. We're starting off really strong here with a beautiful uh, interpretation by Hervé. And actually, there's um, the mock-up is really beautifully done as well. I'll, I'll have a few things to say about setup, and, and, and I'm sure that people know what I'm going to talk about um, but just to um, just to let everybody know, there are going to be about three releases per day. Uh, so over the next five or six days, there are going to be 15 releases, of, uh, 15 evaluations of this particular level. Not that I'm trying to rush things, but wow, we have so many scores to get through. And the, um, the final... 36 or 42 scores yeah the final 42 scores are all are I think they're almost all full length they're each of those evaluations is going to be about an hour long so yeah so there's tons in store coming up not to mention all the website entries um, the website subscriber participants so yeah so so far people have been leaving comments really supportive insightful uh, feedback that can really help a player think about their work, rethink their work, perhaps. All right, Herve. So I'm wondering if you've ever watched my video, uh, Timpani is not a bass instrument. So that is not to say that it cannot be used for bass, but that its primary function is not necessarily to play the bass line. Now, um, I think that in those passages where you do use it for this very gentle punctuation, I think that's tremendously effective for each, you know, for each page, for each of these screens. Is it effective to be used constantly, to be used continuously, right? So in that, in that sense, I can see that you're sort of experimenting with it, right? What if it had been used, what if you had just let pizzicato be pizzicato here, which seems to do the trick just fine, and then let the timpani have a few notes here and there. Now, nothing about this is all that impossible. You have some pitches fairly close together. You have a lot of uh, A's and B's. And, uh, and I think you've got another couple of notes somewhere else. But the problem with this is that it it uh, has a tendency to limit as well the underpinning uh, harmony. Now, of course, you've compensated by having similar pitches played in pizzicato and 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 arco, uh, and of course the, uh, the the timpani is playing uh, a sympathetic note harmonically, right? So, so there's there's a sense that um, that that the actual pitch is being played that you intend to underpin the harmony. However, that is not a trick to be used constantly, right? It is a trick to be used occasionally when you cannot have the right kettle play the right note. So I, I'm feeling that you may be overusing timpani and you may be overusing that trick, right? Uh, so that, that's, my, that's my aesthetic sense. Right, and and I feel that a lot of listeners would feel that this was also, you know, that just maybe wow, you know, after a while you really get used to it. That's the other. That's like the, um, that is the danger of using timpani uh, in this way. Right now, uh, another possible danger too is that the, it's, it's really quite, uh, it's used quite a lot, and the volume is. Is, is fairly high, at least at the beginning, right? So mezzo forte, mezzo forte, crescendo to forte. So really, it is a, it is really like a, almost like a timpani concerto when you consider all of these other instruments are, are very, very soft. Now, I didn't quite understand this. Chimes glissando. So because this is on the harp part. So maybe you're thinking, oh, well, the harpist would reach over and play a glissando on the chimes or, uh, or, or this was going to be a chimes part and you had nowhere else to put it. Right, it might have been easier to just have the celesta play it. Um, also, you you marked spiccato here, which is sort of a leaping bow. And, and generally speaking, I, I tend to associate spiccato more with like a um, 
with more energy, you know, with more of an energetic kind of uh, kind of a kind of playing and, and more more dynamic, right? Like rarely have I ever seen somebody mark spiccato uh, on a part that was piano or mezzo piano. I usually see it like uh, like say like you know, probably my favorite example of that is the um, is the Mo sorry Mozart the Ravel left hand piano concerto where he he uses it as, as a as a very beautiful leaping kind of a um, of a staccato so here you've got staccatissimo you've got spiccato so I, I think saltando maybe use salt and you only have to say it once you don't have to mark it over and over again maybe you had to do that in order to activate the correct sound uh, from your um, from your mock-up I don't know but anyways um, I, I would say that it is enough to have marked uh, staccatissimo and I think sal saltando or saltado s-a-l-t period right that's the that should be enough to get the effect that you want all right so a couple of layout things okay one is uh, you can see that just really there's no need for all of these measure numbers and I think in the guidelines I tell people to just let the you know say the number write the number of the bar at on the first uh, at the beginning of every system rather than every nub bar you know you don't need to number every bar okay that's the first thing and then you just end up with these kind of ugly collisions and another thing too is that the horns are part of the brass section here you have them separated out as if they were their own section and and I'll tell you something there are a lot of there are a lot of hornets who feel that way, okay? But, uh, but really, they should be one section with the brass, right? All you need to do is just lengthen the bar line so that it is all the way across this section. Um, the the timpani and uh, suspended cymbal do not have to share the same line. Sometimes you see that the, the timpani share the same line with the rest of the percussion. That's fine. And sometimes they don't. It's just, I think that's just up to you or up to what you consult with in Elaine Gould. Now, um, we have a bit of a problem here. You say one, three, and two, four. Okay, so it's fine. You're telling us at the beginning. That's great. But here, this goes against any kind of scoring the way that you have put this, right? One and three, two and four. Shouldn't this be two, not three? And this she this should be three and not two. <clears throat> three is the second high horn, right? So this should be one. This should be two, and then just leave it. Don't even you don't have to put this in. Just cross that off. And then uh, and then this could be three and four, right? Um, and uh, right. So here we've got this this kind of jumping around for horn and and I have to say it's it is really not very idiomatic you have it's just almost like um uh oh, what's that uh hero's life um heldenleben you know, like it's 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 like that piece by strauss where the where the horn starts in the basement and goes all the way up to the very top and then comes back down again so that that kind of playing is really hard right it's better it would be better for you to have this part on um, second and fourth horn, and then this part taken over by your uh, your first and third horn. Now you're going way up high here to this high B flat, and you, you know, seeing seeing as how um, you, you know you you still have you have this this pitch anyways in your trumpets. Which will be playing it so much more, so much more effortlessly, right? Um, there's really kind of no need, and you've got three trumpets, and here you've got your your first trombone, I guess it is, or a two trombones going just jumping, you know, down here from low D all the way up to here, up to this high C, right? So. So I mean, I think you need to rethink this. I, I think that really, like, I mean, you've got some great ideas, but you just need to give the right part to the, you know, to have the right job. Like for instance, you know, saying piano crescendo to mezzo forte up here, and I mean, this is just, 
It's not unplayable for a really decent trombone player, but it's just not as effective, right? You've got all these other people doing things that, that could easily do them, and you should let them do them in the range that they're comfortable with, all right? So, so for instance, like I, I would possibly even say that this, that this horn part in here might be completely unnecessary. Just leave it to the heavy brass and then have the heavy brass dole out the, the parts according to what their strength of register is, right? And it's, I mean, of course, any trombonist can play a high C that is working in an orchestra uh, professionally, but, but it, it's still, it's just, you know, this kind of stretched out, doink, 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 you know, I mean, it's, it, it just doesn't have the best effect, right? It's just, it's not as, and like in here, like you're you are splitting up certain things amongst your different instruments, right? And and this, see, this is more rational. But like, what's this is very very difficult. Just playing these thirds and then suddenly you know mezzo forte and then suddenly jumping down to here. Couldn't somebody else play this? Like English horn and oboe? Couldn't they play this pitch, right? And then and then they could play it for longer if you wanted them to double something in here. Uh, as opposed to that, it just it, it's just you know it's like you know it's almost like crazy jazz scat you know it's that kind of um, you know just up and down and everywhere kind of a thing which is just not the it's not the most graceful kind of a line for a bassoon yes it's possible is it you know is it ideal no right so you have to think like what is going to really fit the instrument what is going to make the music sound really effortless and beautiful and so on. Okay, and, and here you're you're going up to high B flat mezzo forte, and that's you know, uh, I mean that is doable on your uh, your first and third horn. This top one being the third horn, it's doable, but you know going up to B, it's almost high C, right? So you know maybe maybe like leave that to the you know, you have ah three trumpets. What do you need two horns on that as well, right? I mean, they can get up to there. They can play softly. It's strange. You've got a lot of mixed dynamics here. Have them all go upwards to the same dynamic. They should all go up to whatever dynamic you want all the brass to play, and don't mix them ar around like this. Just have them all go up to piano or mezzo piano or something, and then diminuendo, and have them all start at pianissimo and go up, right? Don't lessen the effect. Uh, don't don't think. Well, since I have ah three on here, I'll, I'll have them play softer. Don't do. Don't think that way. Just think I will have the amount of of trumpets I need to go up to this pitch at the same dynamic as everybody else. If that's one trumpet, then that's one trumpet. Okay. All right. So um, yes. Yeah, so, so just some things really need a rethink right in here. Okay. But I mean, that's not to say that the idea of the scoring isn't beautiful. Right. It's just that the Maybe the wrong people are doing the wrong job, right? Which is actually the job is the 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 effect that you want is great. Like this is all really cool. The the one comment here the comment that I would have about this is why did it stop? Right? Was why why did we just do this here once and then we have just a little bit and then it sort of petered out and there wasn't any more? I was sort of expecting to hear more. Okay, um, okay, so question of flutes uh, playing like this and so on as the uh, as as you get these really strong pushes in your strings which by the way is beautiful scoring it's just there's a lovely idea here in the scoring uh, you got to say whether or not this is divisi or non divisi I mean, the problem with this is it looks like oh well you just play that open G but that isn't an open G because this is this note is below the uh, the D string right so this would have to be fingered and that would have to be fingered right so anyway just just think think this out a little bit what what you want there see I mean it's all possible to play non divisi but it just you have to ask the player and it's a little it's a little annoying might as well just have it divisi. Okay. Um, all right. So get let's get back to these flutes. All right. Um, why couldn't the lower pitches be clarinets and then the top pitch be ah two flutes? All right. Why did it all have to be flutes? Now I mean, there's something really beautiful about that. 
But once you start pushing in here, uh, and you're getting up to mezzo forte here, and the flutes are descending again, you've got mezzo forte strings here and mezzo piano flutes, and there you will not hear anything here except for possibly the top flute, right? Because here you've got this very big C here, and you know I I think that like you're you're using the flutes here to fill in the harmony, okay? And that's a great idea, but you need stronger instruments at this point, or you need the strings to back way off, right? And then you'll be able to hear the richness, the beauty of the flutes. Some see some things are possible, but do they really work in terms of? Um, you know, do they do they really work in terms of of the the cohesiveness of the texture, being able to hear the meaning of the instrument and everything else? Here you're going to mezzo piano, and we have a mezzo forte in the strings. Pretty much, almost all the the flutes will disappear here. There are better ways of scoring some of these things. Like for instance, I would I would actually have this tide note uh, in second voice. And then the uh, the G and E octaves in first voice, and then um, same thing here. I would have the uh, the the note that changes in second voice, right? So the the C changing to an E here that should be second voice, and then the then the other notes around it should be first voice. Okay, I mean such cool harmonies, really. It's like you're doing these beautiful beautiful things with your flutes but you're not giving them enough dynamic space for them to be heard, right? So that's, that's just something to think about. And then this big swoop up here with all of the brass, even with them really controlling, like let's say that you were to go up to a piano dynamic from pianissimo, like everybody was going piano to pianissimo, the feeling of overtones would have a tendency to sort of have this blare, kind of blah, you know, it'd be almost like a cow mooing, right? Into your beautiful texture. So um, so you just really have to think about that. As far as the Celesta goes, this is all playable, but I would actually do octaves because I, I, I think you just need a little bit of extra support in with for these pitches, and keeping in mind that they are an octave higher. So maybe even add an octave higher to all of these pitches, and then you get the clarity that you need. Okay. Um, all right, so so now let's let's talk about the next section, the 12-8. Okay, and then once again, we've got this, you know, bum, bum, bum. And, you know, and, and once again, middle register flutes are just not very strong. You know, you have the strings pushing into this. You have all of this action here from your, um, from your winds and your brass. And those middle register flutes are just going to disappear. Whereas if you had given them to, say, English horn and oboe, no problem. No problem competing in this texture. But, you know, anything below middle C, anything, pr pretty much anything in the staff, once you get to a forte dynamic with the rest of the orchestra, is going to disappear. So, like, the, what's going to be heard are these notes up here, and they actually need reinforcement in order to blend more beautifully, more realistically with the first violin. So I'd actually, I would actually say A2 flutes on top, and then take these pitches and give them to oboe and English horn or just to the oboes. And then this will balance quite nicely. And then, of course, fix those other problems that I talked about in here. All right, now going on here, like just some of the same things. So I'm not going to dwell on it too much. All right, now, like for instance here, you know, you're going, da, da. At this point, you know, with, with all of these double reeds, they are going to obliterate the flutes right in here. And, and, and also the flutes... Um, like they're marked down a, a one dynamic level, right? And here they're down to mezzo forte, right? So what I do, I'm not sure what you intend with this. I mean, what comes out in the mock-up is is really beautiful, and it's you know, it has this wonderful sense of lyricism, um, with you know setting aside uh, the use of the you know. I mean, all right. So let's talk about the timpani one more time, okay? So the timpani is a heavy footfall. Right? Now you can lighten it up by marking it down to piano and stuff, and, you, and then you have that, you, know, you can sort of have that heavy tiptoe. But it's a heavy tread. So 
it's just sort of like this elephant is stomping its way through your beautiful, delicate, wonderful orchestration, right? So you just really have to think about like the possible overuse of that element, okay? And, and I'm not gonna harp on it. It's, I mean, it was an aesthetic decision that's like, that's what you feel was right for this. It's certainly not unplayable and you really are limiting it. Um, so I, th I thought that I had seen, I thought that I'd seen a G or a D and see now I can't remember. Maybe, maybe it's just his B, B or A. And you have more choices too, in terms of your pitches, uh, rather than just two kettles, right? Okay, um, now I like the variance that you have between registers. Now, see, now this is playable by the bassoons. It's totally playable, but I just didn't, don't get that other one, just to flip back. This right in here, it's just is such a, you know, that's an acrobatic act right there. To get mezzo forte suddenly jump down, lower snout, pianissimo, and so it's just, I mean, it's doable, but it's just awkward, right? You want to, in this kind of graceful lyrical scoring, you want to give your players something that just works, that just, you know, easily works. All right, now, so this, so this is a little bit more, um, like this kind of scoring where you have A2 players, like you have your low players playing one thing and your high players playing another thing. But the thing is that this is a low player thing and this is a high player thing. And once again, we're getting into stuff that I told you to rewrite anyways. So, you know, that high C with your, you know, with your trombones just popping it out there way up high and so on. Um, I would really, like bars like this and this, I would score in tenor clef, right? But just I just think you need a whole rethink of everything right in here. And you also have to have unified dynamics. I don't think you can have, and, and it's weird, you have P forte <clears throat> on the second note of the bar each time. So what is that, what is the first note of the bar supposed to be? I'm not, I don't understand. And then, and then here you've got your trumpets playing piano and your trombones playing forte, right? And then you have your bass trombone pushing in. So you need unified dynamics here. They really all have to kind of be the same thing. Okay. Um, so <clears throat> one thing I want you to think about is that if you're using bass clef constantly for your your horns and you're kind of going back and forth between bass clef and and treble clef all the time, and if you are doing that while you are doubling pitches in the lower heavy brass, then you're you're doing too much. So just avoid that kind of scoring. Use the horns mostly in the within the written range of the staff. I mean, it's it is that is the sweet spot. That is you know everything from I would say F below the staff all the way to the top note of the staff, the uh, the the F at the top of the staff. That's like that's the that's the gorgeous, beautiful register of the horns, right? That's in, and here like you got a lot of that scoring, right? So that's all good. Um, yeah, kind of strange to see. Now here you remind us one, three, two, four. So I mean, if if you already established that earlier, see like the place to put this is right here. So just if you want to remind us that that is the, you know, that different kind of approach is going to be used all the time, then put it here. Don't put it at entrances and of new parts and stuff. Okay. All right. Um, so yeah, I just really think the 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 string scoring, uh, string scoring, excuse me, is is really gorgeous. Um, and I'm, I'm noticing that like you're using staccato everything on everything. What if you were to alternate staccato in one bar and then legato in another? You know, or like just like a nice slurred kind of a thing. Uh, you know. So I'm just assuming you really want yeah da, da. so you really want this to be you know down up down up down up down up down right that you really want these to be bowed separately and you don't want a slur because I'm seeing almost no slurs on anything in the strings right or or in the winds for that matter you, I would assume that this would you know this would really have a beautiful sound to it if this were slurred right at the end of the bar okay. Um, yeah, so I mean, I, in general, like just just look at how uh, nuanced your well, nuance is the wrong word. How um, how much you have tweaked your dynamics, right? And and I want you to rethink. You know, if you want to learn some more from this score, try to rethink everything, and 
have the winds and the strings working together on one dynamic and the brass that's at the same dynamic or lower okay and just and try to have everybody being the same dynamic and then make your decisions according to that rather than having to make the dynamic fit the scoring right make the scoring fit the dynamic right okay so um, yeah so so just I've already said what I'm gonna say about this yeah, so let's move on to B this is great this is my first chance <laughs> to look to dig into section B and see now here you're as your flutes are climbing like like the higher they get the more rational this all is right but they should still be this I mean once again we've got forte piano mezzo piano and they should all be the same dynamic right so it should all be mezzo forte or all forte or, or whatever mezzo forte maybe be better and then and then having your maybe having your heavy brass mezzo piano uh, all the way across and then uh, and then your horn surging in and out you know like piano up to mezzo piano or mezzo forte and then back out again then I think you'd have a really nice kind of a, a blend right in here and this is just really beautiful the chorale that you've got is spooky you know and, but you notice something I noticed Hervé about your scoring in your heavy brass in particular and somewhat for the winds in some places is that really you get like one voice per group right and and it, it you know you you are i think you're just cutting off this beautiful range of color if you got three trumpets we want like three part harmony uh you know just think of all of the all of the things you could do quarterly right uh, to to score a chorale like this rather than just having to have both trombones on one note and and then the bass trombone an octave lower and then I don't know all three trumpets on on this D or whatever just like then you wouldn't have to if you just have one voice you actually get a more beautiful clear intimate sound for this kind of a scoring right it's the the more you can control that the better and just just kind of observation I think that uh, C trumpets would work way better with this score than B flat trumpets. Yeah, B flat trumpets have this beautiful rich tone and everything else, and maybe you you want to get some of these lower pitches more securely, especially if you're going to go down for this uh, written G. However, uh, you know if you're willing to rescore some of this, which maybe you don't really need those lower notes if you've got them in the in the uh, trombones, anyways. Um, you know that a C trumpet just makes more sense if you're in the key of G and you have this brighter, lighter texture, right? Anyways, that's just my thoughts. All right, and then once again, like here you've got Atu bassoons, but what's the what's the articulation here? Is this supposed to be staccato? Should shouldn't it match the bassoons? Do you want to get like a an effect where the bassoons are staccato and the cellos are legato? That's also a cool kind of a thing. All right, so here we get to the sweet spot. Uh, and I'm, I'm so glad that we had like 15 people <laughs> go to semi-brev or you know, take on the semi-brev uh, level and just so that this, you know, we could see this getting a lot of love, right? Now, so this is all playable on the clarinet. Uh, did, you, did you possibly consider, um, you know, what if, what if this were clarinet here and then the then like you had oboes and clarinets take over these upper rolls and then the flutes like in the worked with the English horn or something you know did you think about possibly changing it up to provide some alternate uh, takes on it it really is this is where it gets a really gorgeous in the way in the mock-up you know it just sounds so nice but the weird thing is that you know some of the sound of it has a kind of a almost that sort of legato slurred kind of a sound, doesn't it? It's sort of so. I mean, do you really want your violins to be going? Or do you want them to be going? Do you know what I mean? I mean. Do you really want to keep... I mean, you've had so much staccato in this piece. Do you really want to keep that staccato going, right? Um, yeah. And then once again, there's just heavily 
moderated dynamics. Okay, so so just to review some basics about this much tweaking in the dy dynamics is what you have to be aware of is that the players do not know what is on what the dynamic marking is uh, on the other player on some other player's piece or part, right? So they they are all reading their own dynamics and sometimes they will make assumptions. Right, you'll have your trumpet players sitting next to your trombone players, not really looking at each other's part, and your and then your bass trombonist way at the other end, and you got these trombonists playing mezzo forte, forte. They've got this marked mezzo forte, and the people on either side of them are playing mezzo piano, and then the trump and the and then you know you have your horns way over there playing pianissimo crescendo to mezzo piano, and so they might be thinking. Oh geez, you know everybody else is playing their mezzo forte really loudly, uh, or excuse me, really softly. I should t tone down my mezzo forte too. Do you see? That's the that's part of the problem. And then this, then the tuba player might be hearing all the other heavy ba brass players playing and thinking, "Wow, you know their their sense of what piano is is really strong there. Maybe I should bring mine up." So basically, by having this kind of moderated dynamics in every single staff it really works against the idea of cohesive sections working together you know that like the every single line has got its own little its own you know you're you're kind of putting a a different graphic slider or a or a potentiometer you know uh, on on each uh on on each staff rather than having the sections work together dynamically. Now, of course, like you can have situations like this where you have one of the voices really standing out, like in this case the the strings who are carrying that uh carrying that that theme and then the other instruments playing softly beneath it. That's that's an exception, but it shouldn't be constant, right? It shouldn't be a situation where dynamically everybody is doing everything differently. At least not for this kind of music. Now, there are some styles of music um some modern styles of music, especially like, you know, I'd say Schoenberg's Five Pieces for Orchestra Forwards, where there are a lot of different kinds of things, but that, but that I think that it's sort of taking away from the ability of the players to really work together when they, they are marked this so differently in each section, right? So this is cool right here. Uh, the harp, um, give us a little diagram showing the, give, showing the harpist what the pedal setting is even if it's just a key of G, right? Just to, just to sort of make sure that they, because like they're going to be sitting on a tacit for a while and then all of a sudden, oh yeah, bring, or a multi-rest. I should, I've, I've been using the word tacit for multi-rest. Um, and, you know, I mean, I grew up in a uh, culture where people use that a little carelessly, I must say, some of the people that I worked with. But really, a multi-rest is a multi-rest, and a tacit really is a movement or section that's completely down. So yeah, so they'll be looking at a multi-rest. What's happening after the multi-rest? They're just going to want to set their pedals and forget about it. So they're going to assume that it's in the key signature, but like, don't let them assume. Just give them a pedal setting, all right? Okay, so I, I mean, it's gorgeously scored. You know, I mean, I, I wish that I could talk more. I had time to talk more about... You know, some of the things like the harmony and, and everything else. Uh, I, I really love this cross voicing in here of the violas and the and the first violins. I think that that's very effective. Um, the, you know, part of the problem though is that you know we, we've got some heavy brass in, or just brass in general in there um, that will sort of take away some of the color, some of the beautiful color of that cross voicing and so on. Um, yeah, and then here, uh, you know, I, this is coming up a lot because this is getting, this is getting transcribed. I, I sort of would almost wish for, I mean, it's, it, there's hardly any room for it in you know, such a crowded score, but I would almost wish for two separate voices in this kind of instance. Uh, just to, you know, that would be my engraving kind of side rather than, you know, Interval A2, interval A2, interval A2. But I mean, that is, it is still legitimate to do that. And yeah, you're really sending up your oboes very high. Um, there's no, you know, you know, if they're just going to do be doubled by clarinets anyway, then, uh, you know, I mean, it's kind of really no need. 
And and I, I wouldn't send. I'm, I'm assuming this is R2 bassoons. Yeah, yeah. So R2 bassoons. Yeah, you just you're sending. Like I wouldn't go R2 bassoons above the staff. Right? I mean, there's just kind of no need, right? Um, you could even split this up if you really must do this and have the have bassoon color doubling the clarinets. I would say have the second bassoon play up to up to here, and then have the first bassoon take over and play that doubling the clarinet. And you could even do the same thing, have second clarinet playing up to about here and then dovetailing on this note with first clarinet and so on. I mean, there are, yeah, give, you know, just like the intimate colors of the instruments are more important, I would say, than playing A2 all the time, because anytime you do A2, you are sort of limiting the expressiveness, the individuality of the wind line, right? When you stack them, the wind players have to play in sync more and they have to think about what they're doing. Probably the probably the um the most difficult on this would be like atu oboes because like they have this beautiful colorful wonderful um sense of innocence to them and then when you put them when you double them they kind of have to get rid of a lot of what makes that innocent and they have to be very more focused almost like trumpet like then then you end up getting a trumpet like sound with atu bassoons you have like a just a very focused it's not like a trombone but it's just a very very focused tone and and it really doesn't have that same sense of freedom, you know, and and just you know laughter and joy and and running around um, and getting away with lots of mischief that they would normally do, right? So just just rethink adding so much ah to, and sort of rethink how you're doing one two three four in your horns and some other things. Well, you know, you heard you heard everything that I had to say, but I mean, all that aside. A really cool score, right? And just really enjoyable. And I thought I thought that the mock-up was fantastic. It was just, you know, it was like some like a movie theme. It was really, really well done. Um, so like maybe lighten up on the timpani or something. I don't know. Um, but but really great. I mean, such a strong beginning for this group of scores, the semi brev uh, entries from our Patreon supporters. So thank you so much, Hervé, especially you know, speaking of which, for supporting the channel. For jumping in on this challenge, it's just you know it really means a lot. It's it's great to get a score from you this year, and uh, and thanks everybody who has watched this far. Please leave some constructive feedback for Hervé below. Maybe not repeating what I said so much, or you know maybe you could back me up on one or two things if you feel that that that's necessary. But you know your own thoughts and you know some insights that I may have left out, some things that I didn't get a chance to talk about or missed. Very, very much appreciated. That really makes this much more holistic when we're all joining in. And Hervé, when you see some scores from other participants, especially for this group, the semi-brev entries, could you please like give them your thoughts, even if it's just to say how much you liked something, right? You don't have to be an expert to like something. Okay. So with that, I am just going to go evaluate the next score. So I hope you'll join me in that video. See you soon.